here we are in Singapore, and we're talking about screening the transient transnationalism diaspora, and we've been talking about it from the point of view of middle class uh, majority. But it strikes me that the vast majority of people in this room and in Singapore are part of a diaspora. We, um, my own heritage is I'm half Chinese. Um, my father's from Malaysia. I share a very similar story to I think a lot of people here. We've all come from sort of um, migrant working roots. And I think an interesting question is maybe from the filmmaking point of view or the more academic point of view, when do you think migrant workers stop being part of a diaspora and move into something at the next stage, which I think a lot of people in this room would consider themselves to have done? Um, who should I direct that to? Eway, that's for you. <laughs> I think it depends on how we all want to, de want to define ourselves. So I'm going to just get a show of hands here who actually thinks that you are no, no longer part of the Chinese diaspora if you're Singaporean Chinese. Is there a show of hands? If you're not, or if you are, I think I am. Oh, sorry, question again. Do you, cons <laughs> do you consider yourself to be part of, a chi of the Chinese diaspora even though you were never born in China and you know, you're probably your identity is probably formed in Singapore and New York or wherever else in the world given that you're so mobile? So the question is, who feels diasporic raise their hands, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, part of first, let's see who, who feels that you're part of a diaspora. Who thinks you're not? Because there is a there there is a certain suggest suggestion that if you think you do, you are somehow perpetuating the power of cultural China, for example. Like I have to always go back to that ancestral homeland. And therefore I that is how that's one of the bearings of my identity. You know, I am diasporic Chinese because my ancestors were from China. So I'm still making that reference back to the homeland. Whereas for people who do not feel that they're part of the Chinese diaspora, for example, they might just feel that, hey, this is my home. If I were to be part of any diaspora, it would be a Singaporean diaspora. Yeah. But I mean, it still doesn't stop me from being a bit culturally confused. La. <laughs> That's what I would say. Any other questions? I just wanted to say I really enjoyed the film um, with the Rohingyas, um, Rohingya um, sort of Muslim girl. I, she, I suppose she is, right? Um, uh, yeah, she's. I mean, the actress is Malay. Yeah, I, so I was really shocked because she's cast really well. I had not, for one minute, when her Malay name came out, I thought, oh. wow, she's, oh, she, of course she is. I mean, where are you going to find a girl, right? Yeah. So I thought you casted them really well, especially the old lady. Mm -hmm. And I love how the fact that she spoke her dialect. I love how the fact that then, you know, when she met the Malay guy, she spoke in very Chinese accent of Malay. Everything was very, very original, very authentic, and I thought you kept it very real. Um, so it was easy to follow the story and to believe what was going on. Um, and I just thought, how do you train them or how do you kind of work? Like, this lady, she's, she's like a gem, right? Like, she's just got a story all over her face. And I was just wondering, like, how hard was it to cast them, to get them to have that? Because he looked like, she looked like she really lived there, and that was a, her neighbor, you know, without a shadow of a doubt. And then I, yeah. I just thought, how do you craft that whole thing? Yeah. yeah. Um, sh okay, so I'm just gonna go way back to the script, right? So like I wrote the script in New York, but then when I came back to Singapore and I went to Ubin, then there's a lot of tweaking of the script for my imagination to have to match reality. And then once, there w once I faced the reality of Ubin, then I realized the only way to make it good or convincing is if I just kept to a lot of like authentic details. And so when I started casting, I actually saw like a lot of actresses, like older actresses. She was the first one I saw because she's actually a, the location owner. And then like when I wanted to cast her, my producers were like, are you nuts? You know, because like there's no way to even maybe contact her and she has a landline, but the landline works like 30% of the time. So literally to get to her, we have to be on Ubin. Yeah, and yeah, and that's a bit of a mess to get to Ubin every time you need to talk to her about, oh, don't forget your costume, whatever. But um, yeah, anyway, so b after that, we actually saw a lot of like the veteran theater actresses and TV actresses. But I just felt like even the way they spoke, you know, they carried like some kind of accent, which made me believe that they, they weren't like, they weren't of like a certain, 
I mean, it kind of just shows that they were of a certain class and it wouldn't be convincing to play that role. And no matter how hard they tried to get rid of that, like it still didn't feel believable to me. And I just feel like it would be a bit condescending actually if I cast someone with like really good, like Mandarin, like playing this. Yeah, so then I just went with her and working with her was actually very painful because she couldn't even read. So I had to uh, actually record my script on a tape, a cassette tape, because like giving her an MP3, she'd be like, oh my, like, you know, she wouldn't. So it's just like really like rewind and play and that's it. And it's like, auntie, please don't touch anything. So I just rewind and play. And like, and then I realized I couldn't even label my tape, you know, because she doesn't even read. So I was just drawing on it. And it was just, but it was, in some ways it was like a very nice way to make films, because then you really started to feel how people communicate, you know, like these days we're just like emails, words, language, and and here she is, like, like, you know, the only way for me to literally get to her is just by the spoken word. And I just feel like the whole film is like this, like even the way I researched it was also like that. Um, yeah, and then like having to, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys know anything about acting, but acting is just a lot of like technicalities. You have to walk here, hit this spot at your mark at, at where the light is, and then you say your lines, and then, yeah, but for her there's like <laughs> no such of that. And then so then that's why the way I was filming was also very handheld to just like catch whatever she was doing. It was basically like literally shooting nature, like whatever nature provided, I shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She like um, so the amazing thing about her was that she was a very free spirit, and uh, and so the parrot was actually like I, I rented a parrot and I put it with her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I rented a parrot and uh. And then so she's then uh, on her own, she just started like doing weird, like cool shit with the parrot. And I'm like, oh, and I have to like <laughs> get that. Um, yeah, so then a lot of the scripting was actually just based on like the elements that were just happening on set. And the girl, yeah, the girl was also difficult uh, because she was a non-actress. And frankly, in the course of the film, I found out she wasn't actually even really that in acting or maybe at first she was interested in the idea of acting. But then after a while, it's just like you have to show up on set at 6 a.m. And then you have to stay two hours, wait for your turn to be shot. And then she was just like being crazy. Like after a while, she just didn't want to act anymore. Yeah, so she would start wailing at like from 2 p.m. onward, 3 p.m. And then they actually didn't like each other very much. Yeah, because she was very rude. Yeah, she would actually like scold my granny and she would actually scold. She really hated that Malay uncle. And and then and then I was like, oh my god, like I have a little, I have a tyrant on set, literally. And then so then, yeah. But it was, again, when she was good, she was really good, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's like bad weather, but there's also a certain beauty about it, lah. <laughs> yeah. So then there was a lot of cutting around their performances, yeah. And I would say like for the granny, like she wouldn't do more than three or four lines before forgetting it. So then that's why I had a lot of coverage so I could cut from this to that to that. So it was just all pieced together in the end. Yeah. Maybe I just jump in with just one question. So I was just actually talking about the power of the image. So I was just wondering like, um, this, this, this question is to everyone actually. Like, do you guys, um, the films that you've made or the films that you've seen, do you guys think that um, the, um, these films have actually um, this has any impact to the real life, actually? Like, you know, does it, it brought the visibility to some of these issues, um, but um, is the impact to the real life social causes there or not, actually? So maybe I'll just ask Jolivan. Like, okay, maybe I'll just talk about two examples. So I know like last time, um, it'd be from 2017 to 2011, there was a migration film festival that happened. So it actually um, screened films about migrant themes, but also um, tried to use migrant workers to produce a film as well. And then I also understand that there was this project called Project Ilo Ilo. So um, it was uh, the aftermath of, well, the success of Ilo Ilo, where then a group of volunteers actually came together and uh, gave out tickets to Ilo Ilo and actually you know, brought visibility to the mates and their problems. So I just wanted to just ask everyone about this. Do you have any thoughts? If any one of us has read the new paper recently, there was this report about the, 
a maid who got stabbed by her Bangladeshi boyfriend. Did anyone read that? Yeah, so I'm just wondering about how the media, with their, fo- their photographs, how does it actually perpetuate the stereotype of the Filipino maid and her Bangladeshi boyfriend? Yeah, I'm just wondering, I mean, if anyone out here is in looking in the media or how... Recently, I went on shoot to Bangladesh, and I hate to say it. I know there's like, of course, the salacious part where there's a crime committed. Then you, s- I think sometimes then you read about like where they're from. If it's a horrific crime, like the murder with the, you know, that there's been another case with the Burmese men and stuff. So there've been, of course, there are other murders. I think, but it's it's kind of you're right. It's it's brought up in that vein where oh look at this. But there is truly also a love story with Filipino maids and Bangladeshi workers, and I love it. Like. We took the plane and it was really interesting. So we saw this family and it was like grandma, grandpa, and then um, that's Bangladeshi men's um, side of the family and then his Filipino wife and his two kids. And he was speaking Tagalog with them and they all travel as a family. And of course everyone was going, like a lot of Bangladeshi men going back to Bangladesh. So, you know, everyone was just looking at them and they were so cute. And I thought, you know, if they found love in a hopeless place in Singapore, that's really beautiful, right? I know, I, you know, I might be. So, I, so I guess there is that, you know, there is a um, sort of silver lining as well. It's not all tragedy, but doom and gloom. But um, I, I hear what you're saying as well. But that was in Bangladesh, right? No, that was a is plane in Singapore, oh, Changi Singapore. Airport. So oh. they were getting ready to go back to Bangladesh. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, I think they were moving back or something. Yeah, but the media, I think, is actually one of the real culprits of perpetuating all these stereotypes. For example, I think the open, li- the opening line of the report was. Love hurts, but it doesn't have to be cutthroat. Meaning, yeah, because the, the Bangladeshi man stabbed her in the throat. So you see, when, when you have lines like that, together with the image, you know, so this is when text and image work together to perpetuate a very, very negative stereotype. So I'm wondering how filmmakers can actually counter that. No, and I just think it's very funny. I'm just going to up the amp here a bit. Uh, because like I just also realized like even the language we use right at this moment to discuss this, you know, like like it's kind of like they are so cute, they are happy people. So like even the way we see them, there's also this objectifying thing going on already. Not to say it's wrong, I think it's in some ways inevitable. But yeah, so like every time I'm like making a film, I'm always just wondering how do you sort of like you yeah I don't know um, yeah it's just something that I kind of realize myself too. Yeah. Uh, like okay, I, I I don't know. Okay, this this is really maybe just too simplistic to sort of think of it this way. But I just have to really just sort of think from an inside out rather than an outside. You know, oh, they are so happy. They are dancing. Like you know, that's I don't know if that's a way to think about it. Yeah, and and no offense at all. Yeah, it's yeah, just no something offense. that yeah. <laughs> no, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, in relation to the the, I, I think. Um, these kinds of f- films, l- the Migration Film Festival that you talked about, actually I remember taking part in that film festival as a panelist as well. And that was at a point when, you see, when I first started out this work, nobody was interested in migrant workers. Um, not many people talked about it. And when you said, oh, you know, and when, I, when, when, and when people ask me, so what do you do? So I said, oh, I help migrant workers. And then they would say, oh, what kind of help do they need? Yeah, but now when I talk about it, people seem to understand the issues more. They say, oh, don't they pay a lot of money to come here? Oh, yes, there's a lot of exploitation going on. So there is uh, an increase in that awareness. And I think when all these, when the Migration Film Festival happened, it, it happened at a time when I think there was some kind of, there was an increase, significant increase in, in the level of awareness among, among the Sing- among Singaporeans in general. So I, I, genu- so I, I, I see that as, as a positive sign. Though, of course, the next step and the next challenge is how do we talk you know, about, about migrant workers and, and what kinds of images are we portraying and what is the extent to which they are equal participants, right, in, in the so-called image-making process, in, in the ways in which um, these issues are being discussed. Because one of the, the, the challenges that we face also as a group is how do we involve migrant workers in this process? And a lot more has to be talked about in terms of the political and social participation of migrant workers. And it is certainly very difficult because we have laws which tell them that they're not supposed to do undesirable things, they're not supposed to be political. 
you can't do this, you can't do that, or you might um, lose your job, your work permit might get revoked. So these are the, the, the reality. So even getting them involved in these kinds of processes will be difficult. Like asking a domestic worker to appear in this forum today, it's going to be in very, very difficult because she's probably working in the house and it's going to be very hard for her to ask her employer to give us just some time off just to come here to speak in a panel. The same with construction workers, shipyard workers. So we also need to look at the, the structural impediments, the structural challenges in terms of policies and laws and culture, which prevent them from participating as, as equal members of society. And, um, and with um, the point that you make about the Bangladeshi boyfriend and the domestic worker, yes, it's very sensational, but how I wish also that the media could talk about why it has become such a stigma, why it's such a taboo for domestic workers to have a Bangladeshi boyfriend. Yeah, so what if she decides to have a boyfriend here? So what if she decides to have sex with him? You know, but the, a lot of these media images and the way in which it's discussed feeds into this kind of stigmatization. So that's why you get a lot of employers saying, oh, you know, if my mate goes out on her day off, what if she has a boyfriend, she gets pregnant, then how? And there's a lot of moral policing as well. Right? If you want to go out, if domestic workers, you want to go out, can. Yeah, you, um, if, if you take up English class, computer class, cooking, baking, we are very happy for that. Yeah, but we don't want you to hang out at the, the, the clubs at Lucky Plaza, the pubs at Lucky Plaza, lest you get involved in, in immoral and improper sexual, sexually immoral behaviour. You know? So that, that is the kind of discourse that we have here at the moment. And a lot more can be done to kind of like shift the focus away from that. Yeah. Um, I want to ask a question about representation because when you talk about the power of the image, then you need to ask the question, well, it depends on how many people even get to see the image and who they are. Because I think the most authentic or objective way you can ever be is if you acknowledge your subjectivities. And one question I want to pose to anyone, everyone on the panel is the question of representation in a sense of what sort of different responses have you gotten um, to your films or the stories that you've been trying to tell, when you tell it to an audience that's not Singaporean that or have absolutely no knowledge or sympathies to migrant worker exploitation issues, etc. Because I've um, done sort of film screenings in London um, overseas about migrant worker exploitation or about political exiles and etc. And it's quite funny because like, you know, all the Angmos will be like, oh my god, that's terrible. How can you do these things? But you know, UK itself also is not did not ratify the ILO, ILO convention. And in fact the exploitation of domestic workers in UK households is even worse. But when you tell them that they're like, oh, really? But you know, then they float away. So like a lot of the time it depends on who you're telling this story to. So I'm curious for yourselves, I mean, when you screen this, your films overseas, how do you, what sort of responses do you get and how does it differ from in a context like this? Um, <coughs> I mean, when you see uh, workers dancing, everyone is laughing. And uh, it looks like, you know, some a friend of mine told me that I'm making fun of workers, which was never an intention. But uh, I actually, f people kind of, that, that film is what people get very, I would say, easily. I mean, like, they, they see the environment, how these people work, um, and that's it. But the second one is the one that was shot uh, about this uh, couple, which is a bit more uh, difficult. Uh, and uh, a lot of people cannot... Um, kind of connect to that uh, in comparison to the other two stories that I have in the film because it's uh, maybe something that is kind of connected to Singapore and people who are not from Singapore who didn't see Singapore they cannot find many connections there to the landscapes and whatever I was trying to say or to the image but in my case I can so I don't know I, I kind of uh, have a connection there but I also had like some other things to, to, to mention but maybe later um, you know we were talking about our uh, responsibilities and uh, and to kind of try to portray workers as a, even the migrant is not a term that should be used like a lot of people are against this term but um, you know when you go to a construction site and uh, you come with a camera in the construction site and you're working with people who uh, spend two years just to get on that construction site they're not gonna joke they're not gonna show their personality they're just gonna work and when they see you they'll put the helmet you know and they will uh, pretend to be the best workers in the world 
And uh, if you think about the laws, and if you learn about the laws, uh, or like, for example, company uh, prisons, or, uh, you know, working hours, um, then, you know, this whole thing is not really funny, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, it becomes really a serious issue. It's like a human catastrophe, if you wish, you know. But uh, how do you portray that? You know, you, uh, you, um, you know, with film, you kind of have to make films. You don't make statements. So I feel um, when I screen it overseas, like the reactions, the reaction is actually kind of similar. Maybe I don't get as, get as much laughs because people don't understand the reference of the culture and the dialect of the granny. Uh, but yeah, wh wh I mean, whatever underlying stuff I have to say, I think people kind of get it like, uh, yeah, wh wherever the film has been screened. And sorry, unfortunately, this will be the last question because we're running out of time, but please. Okay. Um, this is more of in response to what Jolathan said, but it's a question for everyone. Um, I think the strength of these films, for example, in, in Vladimir's film was the translation, to see them singing, but to also understand what they were singing. And also, um, so in relation to what you said about stigmatization, I'm wondering if stigmatization is more uh, a serious an issue than the lack of translation of uh, migrant work worker lives and culture, because without the translation sometimes, um, for example, uh, I'm in poetry, so we recently held a migrant workers poetry competition. And before that, very few Singaporeans were aware that our construction workers could have an, a, an intelligent life, so to speak. You know, a life in which they are able to construct stories and have personalities. So is it stigmatization that is more dangerous or the lack of translation? Yeah, I guess like you can say put it that way, so that it's lack of translation. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was going to mention that uh, competition because I wanted to, to come with a camera <laughs> for this competition. Um, and uh, it's a great initiative. There were other also initiatives. So uh, also, on the other side, you have the borders that are always there, you know, and the border sometimes is a camera or a fence or uh, just time, you don't have time to, to get in touch, but it's impossible to establish contact with, uh, it's very difficult to establish contact with, uh, I have a friend who works in university, he invites, he does parties for maids. So he invites them and they all uh, party together and they uh, dance and I don't know, play music. And uh, and it's considered to be like, you know, you're doing something crazy. Like, you know, <laughs> you're just doing a party with people. So uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, it could be both things, yeah, maybe. Um, I, I do see that stigmatization is also coming from class discrimination because um, we don't think that these uneducated people can write poetry, or these uneducated people who uh, you know, can think for themselves or know what's best for them. So in relation to um, domestic workers having boyfriends, for instance, yeah, so there's a lot of this kind of moral and social policing going on, yeah, because it comes from this very paternalistic attitude. Yeah. Um, firstly, you are from a third world country, secondly, you are working class, and then thirdly, you are, you are a woman. Right, so I think it's it's a combination of these factors and also laws and policies which encourage these kinds of behavior. Um, we have laws and policies which tell domestic workers that they cannot get pregnant, um, which and and which tell them they are not allowed to engage in illegal, immoral, and undesirable behavior. This is the actual legislation that's being phrased. Yeah, um, domestic workers have to sign this. Um, agreement when they come here. It's, it's an agreement between them and the government that they will not do these things. Yeah. So I guess, um, yes, communication has to, to do with it, but I, uh, my, my sense is that larger social structural um, forces are contributing to this problem because even if the communication is there, but if the, the stigmatization that stems from gender, class, and discrimination um, it's not dealt with, then, you know, I don't think we'll be able to deal with these issues um, effectively. Yeah. Any comments from here? I think it's good. I can talk about it. <laughs> okay, um, I think, okay, time is up, sorry. I think. Yeah.
the the people who want to screen another film here. So, <laughs> so thank you everyone for coming today, spending uh, the Saturday afternoon with us. Thank you. So please, actually, um, outside um, the table, we have flyers from actually courtesy of a library at Esplanade, who has prepared like a list of reading materials on topics of, well, again, diaspora and transnationalism. And of course, um, EOA also prepared those questions which are yet to be answered, which we can always, um, our, there's a, actually a free frame group, um, part of the series on Facebook. So I will post the questions there. If anyone has any comments, feedbacks, please respond to that. And lastly, I want to also thank Film Guts, um, Wilkis Plus for providing this lovely venue. And of course, everyone here, our panel, Iwe, Kirsten, Jolivan, and Vladimir, a last round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>